It's Agent CQ Jack Creston. I have other names. I have a real name. But the girls on their best behavior call me HMC Warm Dry Clothes. So, I thought I'd make a quick little video and just go over a few select verses. I thought, you know, maybe since I love the Bible so much and know so many verses that I should, you know, maybe just list a couple. And I only really had one place to start and then I was going to go somewhere else. Yes. And then, um... Well, we'll see what happens from there. So, first of all, let's go to Nehemia, chapter 8. Nobody knows what the book of Nehemia about, is about. That's um, after an exile to Babylon. Nehemia, who was cupbearer of the king, um, was sad and he couldn't hide it. So the king asked him what was wrong and he asked him if he could go back and build Jerusalem. And the king gave him a certain amount of time to do that. So, here they are. Now, there's all this stuff going on, but right to the verse anyways, you can check it out. So, Nehemia and Joshua and Bani and all these other men, and uh, Ezra, they're all, um, you know, reading scriptures before the people in the streets as they rededicate Jerusalem, essentially. And right here. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. Do I highlight it? No, I highlight it. Let's see. So they read so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So that's one of my favorites. That's that's one that's that's like first when you're reading the Bible. Um another one of my favorites, Psalm 119. Because it's hard to beat 119. You can't. That's this is where self worth comes from. 119, I think 29, let's see, yes, remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously, that's one of my favorites, there's one that's right here too, essentially, there's 176 verses in Psalm 119, and it goes in sections of 8, and there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so 8 times 22 is 176. And that's how this is arranged, one group of 8 for each letter. So the theme is pretty consistent, you'll see that. But as I said, this is where self-worth comes from, if you really have a connection to life. So, another favorite verse, let's see. Um, Daniel. Daniel 12. And start here. This talks about the uh, abomination of desolation. These are the days that we're living in, actually, and I would even say we come quite ways through. Um, where? Okay, let's see. And the why? Hold on. Troubles. Um. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that be, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Let's see what I'm looking for is the wise shall understand. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. It's three and a half years. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. So thirteen hundred fifty or thirteen hundred thirty five days. <clears throat> so you might want to look into what the abomination of desolation is. It's also um, noted in Daniel eight. And it's also noted in Matthew 24. As a matter of fact, um, the majority of that verse is regarding this time, the abomination of desolation and the coming of the Christ, which is worth noting. Let's see, let's see here. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers 
believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So the Son of Man is essentially the Lord. This is what the time he's talking about, the second days of Noah, when the Lord comes back after all this and 2,000 years since Christ. But notice he's not the desert, so go not forth. But what does in the secret chambers mean? I'm pretty sure that means like, you know, uh, Kama Sutra and Tantra and certain Buddhism, sex and Zen and art of war and stuff like that in the secret chamber. Right? So Buddha, don't get me wrong, is a very dignified man. Sakashina, known as the lion of the tribe of Isaac. For Gad, apparently, was um, exiled. And upon their exile, they ended up somewhere else. And um, Buddha, or Budai, or the people, the Budai, are those who are alone from Israel, as noted in the book of Hosea. And that's Beit Dalit Dalit, or B-D-D, -D, that's the Hebrew word for Budai. So, um, there's that. What else we got? Um, of course, as everybody knows, Isaiah 53. Who hath believed a report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or, nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And it goes on to describe Jesus. But that's a good verse right there. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Great, great chapter. The whole Bible's full of great chapters. So what else we got here in Isaiah? Isaiah 24 describes the state of the world in the end times. Which, if you read carefully, is very much like this day that we live in. See further, there's more description of the time that the Lord comes, and that's found in Isaiah 30, starting with, I think, chapter 20. Something interesting to be noted here. Chapter 24. The oxen likewise, and the young asses that ear the ground, shall eat clean provender, which hath been winnowed with the shovel and fan. So, what that means is processed food, essentially. Grain coming out of the bag, feed the chickens, you know, cows eating their oats. And there shall be upon every high mountain, and upon every high hill, rivers and streams of water, in the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall. Doesn't that sound like a fountain pop in a quickie mark? Yep, and it goes on to describe more about it. You should check that out. What else is a good verse from the Bible? There's verses for hope if you want hope. For example, uh, Jeremiah 29. Many people know this. 29, 11, 12, and 13. Some people just know 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then you shall call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me, and find me, when you shall when ye shall search for me with all your heart. See, that's a that's a it's like a promise. It's an instruction from the Lord. There's another verse. Um, like it, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, no, this isn't like it, actually, but Ezekiel, no, not 35. Should I be saying about Ezekiel? Ezekiel 36. The later, latter half, let's say, let's see, from 24, I think. Yeah, from 24, let's see. And a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. 
And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Going on, it says, Not for your sakes do I do this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. It explains more. Ezekiel is a, a visionary prophet, many visions and prophecies. He's seen uh, angels and such. Then, what else do we have for another favorite? Coming to the New Testament, let's try Ephesians 4. This is a long favorite. Ephesians 4, 11, 12, 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into, all, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ." See, and at a point like that, there's no error between people because, well, you're not going to fool me in judgment because I know it as well, especially being connected to Christ. Because as it says in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in the preamble, whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And essentially what that comes down to is the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Because... Where there is no supremacy of God, the rule of law is uh, stagnant. It's not only stagnant, it's static. See, there's no saying, well, you killed somebody in self-defense because you killed somebody. Because that's the rule of the law. But when we take into account the supremacy of God, we can say, well, we know that you're pressing a person to the point of... You know what I mean? So there's that... Essentially, the description of the preamble comes from uh, an essay written by a man named Brayton Polka, and it's entitled the same, uh, whereas Canada is founded on principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And he goes into a synopsis of uh, Baruch Spinoza, who was a philosopher, I think, in the 16th or 17th century. I could be wrong, maybe before that. But he says that where there is no supremacy of God and the rule of law, neither exists. Because each one, in turn, enforces the other, and they're neither dependent nor independent of each other. They actually both have to exist to satisfy uh, this type of constitution. But what that's saying is it's neither relative nor unrelative. So anyways, you could get into reading that. I, I didn't come here to describe that right now. Let's just go back to more scriptures. Okay, so coming back and staying in the New Testament now, I guess, I don't know how many minutes left I've got to record. But um, let's try something from... Romans, chapter 3. What advantage, then, hath the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged and then it goes on to say more about you know what if what if well here but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of god what shall we say is god unrighteous we taketh vengeance i speak as man god forbid for then how shall god judge the world for if the truth of god hath abounded through my lie unto his glory why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, 
Let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So, well, here, you can read the rest of that too. I'm just giving you head, headers in, ways in, foots, feet in the doors. Everybody loves Hebrews 11.1, 1, the description of faith. This is the true definition of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So people try to say faith is your belief, faith is believing in. Well, none of that's true. When you believe in something, you look for faith. You know, you wait for faith. And faith, believing in, that, that hoping, that's a hoping, that's the hope. Waiting for the faith. Because it's like saying, I know I'm going to do this right. I, I just know I'm going to win this race. And you can feel it inside. That's the substance. But that's also the evidence of what's not yet. So when you feel that faith, you know that's what faith is. But there's a difference between faith and knowing. Faith just leads to knowing. Continuing on, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are not seen were not made of things which do appear. Oh, sorry. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things that which... Let me try this one more time. <clears throat> Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And that's as clear as any scientific explanation of the world can get before the, the advent of the telescope and electro-telescope. Right? To know that the things that, that we could see, our bodies, the plants, they're all made of much smaller things that we can't see. And um, that is what Hebrews call the Yud. That is what a Yud is, the letter Yud. That's the tenth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the Yud. And it's the smallest letter. And they say that all of existence is made up of tiny yuds. Hebrew being the language of God, because at the Tower of Babel, God and 70 angels drew lots for the nations. And that was their languages, their guidance, everything. And Israel fell to God. So Hebrew is the language of creation. And this is why Israel is the chosen people. Because God chose them. So, moving on. There's no real moving on from the scripture. The scripture is anything and everything and everything beyond. So, what else do we have in the scripture that's wonderful? Let's go to the seven churches letters, chapters 1, 2, and 3. This is, there are seven lampstands and seven stars. And the seven stars... And the seven lampstands are the seven churches, and the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. So the Lord has a message for each church. You should check that out. It's pretty intense what the Lord is saying to people. And these are all real places. So this is what was going on in the portion of the, this portion of the world at this time, just so you know. So that's one thing. Book of Revelation is very intense. The book of Jude, book number 65 in the... Christian canon is the book of judgment. It's the simple judgment of man and his soul and the spirits. You have to understand it because it's, well, every action is a description. So I'll let you read Book of Jude by yourself. What else we got here? Um, Galatians 5.15 Galatians 5.15 says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Obviously, he's not, he's not talking about physically eating somebody. It's spiritual. It's psychological. Right? So consider that very deeply. That's a very important verse. In fact, it is important enough to highlight with, I think. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, which is a description or the answer to this verse here. Pink? I like purple, but there's no purple. 
Let's try it. No, let's go back to pink. Okay, and this we will make, let's say, pink. Okay, full. Any more verses to mention right now? Oh, well, obviously, John chapter 3. This is what I say to anybody who is not a Christian and doesn't seem to be receptive to the gospel. I say, go, read John chapter 3. Read John chapter 1. After that, it's your choice. I've done my part. This... Here, demons hate it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Demons do not like that at all. Even going on, you can go as far as 9 or 10 for the same purpose. See? And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And that's obviously all... Right, so John chapter 3 again, let's refer, return to this. This is the baptism sermon of Jesus Christ himself. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Oh, sorry, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. Remember that. So when you think somebody's suspicious, you're wrong. It ain't just like that. Coming forward, we find this. And this is the condemnation. You're going to have to read in between. I'm not giving you... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not walking you through with my hands, by your hands. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What does that mean? And this is the condemnation. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. They don't get the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. That's my salvation, right there. By this, I was saved. Because God is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord God. That's uh, actually, I have my testimony on my channel. So, maybe I'll do one more verse, and then we'll go forward from there. Let's try... No, we'll do two more. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 8, 9, and 10. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, or after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So simple witchcraft and silly things. For in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. 
Okay, let's go forward one more verse. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, which is baptism. So, one more verse. We'll go back to Psalms 15. And I won't do the verse, I'll read the whole chapter. This is one of my favorites. This is one of the most important Psalms, I think. And uh, when you hear it, you'll understand why I say so. Psalm of David. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he that honoreth or but he honoreth them that feareth the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Praise the Lord. Amen. Selah. Selah man. Selah man. So, that's the video.